video games to me are well, a murder simulation. This was a, maybe a video game to this video evil demon. Yeah. He wanted to be a super soldier in the simulation. Video games that are now common. Now common. Not great PR for video games. In fact, this is one of mainstream media's most common talking points when it comes to video games. The notion that their child is consuming hours upon hours of explicit and violent content through these games is drilled into their heads. This shifted viewpoint is reminiscent of cultivation theory. For those not in the gaming community, their knowledge on the subject can typically be just from these news sources. And that is by no means their fault. I mean, I really don't care about golf. The only thing I know about golf is Tiger Woods. And the only thing I really know about Tiger Woods is that he cheated on his wife. Therefore, golf to me is just men who cheat on their wives. Now, I know this is by no means true, but it's the conclusion I've come to with the data that I have. Turning it back to video games, many only know about the mainstream explicit video games, the M or even AO if we're feeling really naughty. Therefore, to them, video games are just a way for people to practice killing and beating up sex workers. I'd like for you to hear me out for a bit. Maybe consider altering that viewpoint, possibly to one that sees video games as their own unique storytelling medium, which has the same prestige as film or literature. I'd like to argue that the issue is you've never been fully introduced to story-based video games. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a bit, but first let's take a trip back in time, to before video games even had a chance to garner any of their influence. Now, I understand that I was not alive for most of what I am about to discuss, and that you who are watching this probably was. But please trust my credibility on the subject. I am a young person with strong opinions and access to Wikipedia. At-home video games in their infancy were extremely simple. Almost everyone, even you, I'm sure are familiar with Pong. Many of these early games were dumbed-down ports of their arcade counterparts. The arcade model for video games did not have a player sitting down for hours at a time, day after day. They had a cycle of kids with quarters who wanted to get a high score. Simple story elements may have been involved, but they were by no means in the forefront. It wasn't the proper environment for a story to be told, nor could the technology at the time handle it. Developers knew this, and once they had the at-home portion, things began to change for what people desired from a gaming experience. Video games began to separate from their arcade father and have a rebellious teen phase. Sadly, much like a teenager, they were by no means equipped to carry out their aspirations, those being an immersive story-based game. The Atari video computer system is 20 cartridges with 1,300 game variations you play on your own TV set. The Atari 2600 was the standout console for the start of these baby steps. Well, it saw games such as Yar's Revenge, in which the player controls an insect-like creature called a Yar who must dibble or shoot through a barrier in order to fire his Zorlon cannon into the breach. The objective is to destroy the evil Quotal, which exists on the other side of the barrier. Now, I'll be honest, I got that from a website, so I'm not sure I can tell you who is evil just based on this captured footage. Nor am I sure I said any of those names right, and I probably didn't. Back then, video games were simple. Whoever is shooting at me must simply be evil. Done. But Hannah, you yell, how would anyone know that back in the 1980s? When they couldn't just Google the plot like you just did. Well, you see, they knew that because infant story-based video games leaned on one of the earliest storytelling mediums, books. Although this is going away with the increasing commonality of purely digital game downloads, all physical copies of games come with a manual, which explains simple things such as controls, setup instructions, and sometimes fun little extras. Back before story elements could be given to the player in-game, exposition would be given to the player in this booklet, sometimes almost resembling a short story. What you see here is the Atari 2600's Adventure, one of the first story games. I couldn't tell you anything about it based on this footage, but whoever was playing it back in the 80s knew that this was a man who was in a castle who was trying to recover an enchanted chalice, all thanks to this manual. To juxtapose this, games have also been purely text-based. Early computers in the 70s and 80s took a completely opposite approach to consoles at the time and had games that played much more like Dungeons and Dragons. Colossal Cave Adventure was one of the first adventure games. It throws you right into it. The player can type simple commands in order to move about and interact with their environment. As you can see, video games have always had their interactivity. Without that, they're simply not a game. But, they have started off without a story. This is where the fort begins in the medium. We see a divide between games that use their gameplay as a vehicle for the story, and those who use it purely as exposition to justify the gameplay. 
In this video, I am focusing on the former, as they are the magnum opus of what I feel the medium has to offer. They are a story-based video game. The game caters itself to the person experiencing it instead of the other way around. The player's actions matter. They have an effect on the environment, characters, and the story unfolding around them. You matter. You didn't have anything to do with that, did you? As technological advancement began to allow for it, video games started incorporating these two storytelling methods together. Nintendo's SNES allowed for more enriched visuals to accompany text on screen, in theory the best of both worlds. Take for example The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. Here we can see the player being explained the story of Hyrule, the kingdom they must protect. Not only does this make the game more interesting, but it also gives the player an emotional connection to the actions they make in the game. Compare that to its older brother, The Legend of Zelda. The player isn't given much to work with here. All I have here is some old man telling me that it's dangerous. No shit, everything is trying to kill me the second the game cartridge boots. But what if that exposition didn't need to be explained to the player in text? What if they watched a cutscene? Early video games were stored on cartridges that could be inserted into a game console. They loaded fast and were quite sturdy as the plastic housing protected the internals. A major flaw, though, was the nail in the coffin for this physical formatting that being their lack of storage size. Many games in the time of the N64 were limited by the storage capacity of the game cartridge. The 3D graphics required much more storage than the cartridges could handle. The PlayStation 1, released a year prior, avoided this issue by using CDs instead, which allowed for much more storage. Through this, the medium begins to take on a different storytelling crutch than that of books. This time, film. This increase in storage not only meant more detail-intense graphics could be saved, but full-on movie cutscenes could be played as well. This is how the medium begins to flourish in a more visual manner, moving away from a novel and beginning to take on more of the storytelling qualities of a film, such as body language and dialogue. Show me, don't tell me. Resident Evil was released in 1996 for the PlayStation 1. The game opens with actual shot footage. It's quite corny, but still impressive nonetheless for the time. It sets the player up for what they are about to get themselves into. Before in-game rendered cutscenes became popular, this was a common method used to move the story along. Taking that advancement one step further, this new CD technology was also used for games such as Night Trap on the Sega CD, which was almost entirely shot footage. It is also one of the most infamous games for starting the pitchfork parade directed at violent video games. As it doesn't go much with the subject at hand of story-based games, I won't dive deeper into that hot button issue and defend it, but I will let this brief extremely violent clip speak for itself. Megan, this isn't gonna work. You're not scaring me. Wait. What are you doing? No! Leave me alone! No! Yeah, it's real rough stuff. Consoles see a little last phase before they begin to settle into how we are used to visually seeing them today. If I could equate this into the societal human life cycle again, this is when video games first entered college. They're trying to figure out where they fall in the world of art mediums, what their role is. Still not fully equipped with the technology to do what they truly want to. We see graphical improvements with the GameCube, PlayStation 2, and the original Xbox, but still the lack of storage space and sea legs from shifting to 2D to 3D is evident. Jumping ahead a bit to the year 2010 and onward, we now have more of what applies to present day video games and the technology they are able to utilize. Harping back on my dumb metaphor, story based video games have just now graduated college. Microsoft's Xbox 360 and Sony's PlayStation 3 dominate the home console market for serious gamers. With those two consoles, we enter what I and many others, at least I hope, would describe as the golden age of video games. Now that we are all certified experts in the history of story-based video games, I'd like to return to what I addressed at the beginning of the video, which was the fact that you, yes you watching this, have never been fully introduced to story-based video games. Sure, now you know the history, but I'd like to present to you some examples of what that history has brought to us. Back to the stupid metaphor for the last time I promise. These games have excelled in their chosen major in college. They got hired right away, make six figures, are down to earth, and have a super cool girlfriend. 
They have found their place in the art world and have all the tools they need to thrive. There is no longer a need for another medium to crutch themselves on in order to tell their story. With this, they truly become their own storytelling medium. Before I begin to introduce more detailed examples of games, I would like to warn you that I will spoil major plot points for these video games. As I am talking about story-based games, it's hard to argue about their story without explaining their story. The first game I'd like to introduce you to is Fallout New Vegas. Now my personal bias will definitely come more into play with this section, as I think this is one of the single greatest games ever made, and without a doubt one of the best I've ever played. The reason for which I feel this way directly aligns with why I'm bringing it up to you in the context of this argument about the validity of story-based games. This game takes place in the post-apocalyptic nuclear version of Las Vegas, dubbed New Vegas. In this wasteland, new societies have formed, all struggling for power over the Hoover Dam, which is the sole source of power in clean water. The opening narration of the game informs the player that they are Courier, hired by the Mojave Express to deliver a package to the New Vegas Strip. What seemed like a simple delivery job has taken a turn for the worse. The game begins with the player getting shot in the head and buried alive by a man named Benny. He is after the package you were meant to deliver. You are then uncovered and restored back to health. It is at this point that the player at home can begin to create and control their courier, beginning by adjusting what they look like, how intelligent, strong, or lucky they are, and then picking special traits which will help you play the game how you want to. An example of one of these customization options is a perk named Black Widow, which allows certain dialogue options when talking to male characters. Another one, Good Natured, rewards the player for being more of a pacifist. Their abilities with medicine, speech, repair, science, and barter skills are increased while their attack-based skills take a heavy hit. You are able to create the player you want and complete the game how you choose. Returning to the notion of dialogue options mentioned previously, New Vegas is filled with witty and interesting character dialogue. Have you ever tried to indulge in all-consuming urge to kill when you don't have opposable thumbs? Or hands? Or anything other than a bread slot? You'd have a lot of pent-up anger. Which can have important effects on your story or even just your gameplay experience. This game is unique as there are few situations you cannot talk yourself out of. In fact, in theory, you can beat the entire game's main quest without attacking anyone. It would be difficult, but the option is there for you. And with that, Fallout New Vegas has been beaten without attacking anyone or anything. And therein lies the beauty of this game. Options. You, the courier, hold the fate of New Vegas in your hands. You may side with whomever you choose. This land is without law and order, and you may choose to fix it how you like. You may choose to restore the old world democracy through helping the new California Republic, or on the other side of the coin, allow Caesar's legion to reign over the people, enslaving the women of the land. But those more black and white outcomes are not your only options. You may also allow for an independent New Vegas, ruled by its smaller factions. The game encourages you to meet all of them and make an educated choice for yourself. Depending on your actions throughout the game, these groups will grow to idolize or despise your character, each bringing its own set of eases and difficulties. With the way New Vegas begins, your character has lost all their memories from a head injury. You play as someone who has forgotten their past, so you work to figure out your past, making new memories for them. By the end of the game, the character feels like you. The game feels your own, because, in theory, you've created that environment. The game feels your own, because, in theory, your actions have created that environment. They have shaped the lives of the characters in that story. Well, howdy, partner. Good to see you again. Boss is waiting for you upstairs, so get a move on. All of this talk about choices may have you thinking about a choose-your-own-adventure book, a much more wholesome option to have the same sort of custom experience. But I would argue that video games create one which is vastly different and much more immersive. Instead of just flipping to page 24 instead of page 38, you are performing a much more complex set of actions to make these choices. When I say The Walking Dead, I'm going to assume that your mind goes here, or here, but let's go here instead. An episodic adventure game which takes place in a zombie apocalypse with all the same elements you're familiar with from the television show or comic books, but with an entirely different set of characters and in an entirely different medium. The Walking Dead begins with the main character Lee in the back of a cop car. 
Some dialogue with the cop lets the player in on the fact that he's being taken to prison. We aren't able to learn for what until much later. The car suddenly crashes and Lee awakens to find that the cop is no longer human. He escapes the car to a nearby house. In there, he meets Clementine, an eight-year-old girl whose parents are away on a trip when the zombie outbreak begins. You've been all by yourself through this? Yeah, I want my parents to come home now. I think that might be a little while, you know? Oh. Look, I don't know what happened, but I'll look after you until then. She agrees to come with you and the two of you head out to hopefully find somewhere safe. Throughout the rest of the game, Lee becomes a parental figure for Clementine. Not only do you, the player, feel like you have to ensure that Lee navigates this pandemic safely, but you also feel responsible for this little girl. Actions and choices you make with other characters always have her in the forefront of your mind. Like how a pregnant woman says they're eating for two, you're acting for two in this game. It forces you to make split-second decisions with grave outcomes. One of the earliest decisions the game forces you to make is between saving a small child, Duck, whom you just met, and Sean, the older son of a man whose farm you're staying at. The game gives you mere seconds to make this decision. If you don't, it punishes you by killing both. By choosing Duck, you gain respect from his father, Kenny, but the father of the farmhand kicks you out, thus losing your shelter. This is ultimately the better choice as Sean dies anyway, and having Kenny as your ally is critical as the group begins to grow larger. Understanding the impact, both positive and negative, of your decisions is what this game is about. Duck eventually gets bit, meaning that he must be killed or left behind. Clementine has formed a bond with Duck as they are in a similar age group. You must choose how to explain to her the situation. The player must decide if being blunt, beating around the bush, or just straight up lying to Clem is the best decision. That choice will change how she treats you, how she sees you. She's putting him out of his misery. Oh. Yeah. Lee begins to see Clementine as a second chance, redemption for his previous crimes. With the player later finding out, that crime was killing a man who was sleeping with his wife. He has a strong arc throughout the game. Towards the very end, Clem is kidnapped by a man who believes he can take better care of her than Lee, as he had a family before the outbreak. Lee hunts this man down and the two confront each other. Through their interactions, the player begins to realize their implicit bias. Their previous belief that whatever they are doing must be the best thing for Clementine begins to crumble. The game humbles you. You learn you never even bothered to remember her birthday. One of the last few iotas of humanity left for this little girl in her cruel environment. But her birthday was six days ago. I know how to be a dad, you know. She wouldn't be exposed to what she has been with you. It's not happening. You're crazy. Keeping her with you is crazy. The player while controlling Lee has exposed her to endless violence and turmoil. And yet, in the end, she still chooses you. Die! Not because of the bond she and Lee have formed, but the bond you and her have formed. I... 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 It's okay. It's okay. I... You may not have the same freedom in making Lee your own character as you do in, say, Fallout New Vegas, but he has so much development through the game that he feels like a close friend you've been providing advice to. And the third-person perspective also adds to this feeling. The player feels like a fly on the wall. In the process of refreshing myself on this game for writing this paper, I started crying multiple times. I cannot emphasize enough how soul-crushing this game is. And the fact that this game is quite gory and in many parts violent isn't lost on me. But as I mentioned before, that violence is purposeful. In this scene, Lee has to put his own brother out of his misery. I don't know what happened to mom and dad, but I know if you were there, you would have died for them. So, yeah, I'm going to assume that's what happened. He is unable to simply kill him by putting the axe through his head, because despite his grotesque appearance, that is still his brother. Instead, he chops over and over through his neck, blood and gut spattering. The player is forced to aim an attack over and over and over. He is in a sense murdering his own brother, and these visual and physical elements help immerse the player in just how horrifying of an experience that is. 
they are forced to raise the axe, aim it, and follow through, continuously, instead of just once, because that is how Lee feels. This isn't an emotionally or physically clean experience. It would be disingenuous for the game to soften these aspects. The game also excels in making you feel so guilty for anything you do. It plays cat's cradle with your emotions. Film or books can make you empathize with a character who feels guilty, but a video game can make you personally feel guilty. You press that button. You're the reason that happened. Let's go. Be careful. I'm supposed to tell you that. Although, a good story-based game doesn't have to contain all of these story variations. Shifting gears to a more hot-button type of game, a first-person shooter, Bioshock Infinite doesn't contain all of these variables. The story is railroaded out for you from the start. Your character has a destiny, which becomes more and more apparent to the player as the plot of the game unfolds. No matter what you as the player do, you are stuck watching the story unfold a certain way. Your actions cannot change fate, but you still feel the urge to try. The game begins with you, Booker DeWitt, being told he needs to Where's the girl? And why the way you do it? That girl being Elizabeth, who, at that point, you think is just a lady trapped inside a giant flying tower. Did I mention this whole city is in the sky? Columbia, the game's setting, is a steampunk city-state that is suspended in the air. All of its inhabitants also revere its prophet, Father Comstock. All of its inhabitants are also extremely racist. You gonna throw it? Or are you taking your coffee black these days? <laughs> so you travel to Columbia to get Elizabeth. Once you are there, you are outed as the false shepherd. Now, where'd you get that brand? Ah. Don't you know that makes you the backstabbing snake in the grass false shepherd? Everyone in the city believes you are here to corrupt Elizabeth and overthrow Columbia. A narrative pushed by Comstock. Therefore, Show them what we got planned, boys! They all want to kill you. You eventually find Elizabeth and convince her to come with you, claiming you will take her to Paris. Obviously, you know this is a lie. You're using her to pay off a debt. Another game that makes you feel guilt, and this is one that is great at it. I'll elaborate more on that in a minute. Elizabeth can open tears, which are rips in the time-space continuum, which allow access to other parallel worlds. Please stay with me now. Booker and you as the player are getting quite confused by now. Who is this lady and why can she do this? How can you be the false shepherd when you've never been here before? Because, put simply, you have. Do not alert Comstock to your presence, stop. Whatever you do, do not pick number 77, stop. 77. 77, that's a lucky number. Number 77, come and claim your prize! You are in fact Comstock. He's Zachary Comstock. A major turning point occurs for Comstock many years ago, after he makes the decision to either get baptized or remain without faith. The former becomes Comstock, and the latter Booker DeWitt. In Comstock's timeline, he is unable to have a child. Therefore, he went into another timeline, through a tear, to take Elizabeth and raise her as his own daughter. How? Who did he get this baby from? And why did he give it up to you, you ask? Booker. This gambling debt? He's already paid that off. He did when he sold off his little girl, Elizabeth. That is your daughter. You are ready to sell her again. Your character hasn't changed. You got back into the gambling debt and accepted the same offer. The game rewards exploration and curiosity through clues. You as the player are able to learn all of this much earlier than the linear game intends you to if you desire. In the game, there are storytelling objects called voxophones, which are essentially audio diaries created by characters in Columbia. As you progress in the new world, you can hear yourself as Comstock on these tapes. These are entirely optional for the player to find. You are welcome to finish the game and be completely confused about what the hell just happened, as many did. Bioshock Infinite ends with Elizabeth and Booker going back to that original baptism choice, the moment where he split to become Comstock. Elizabeth and all their variations of her from various other timelines join together to drown you. Like the wretch killing its creator Victor Frankenstein for being brought to life. This moment is poignant. Although you as the player were absolutely not there for all of those timelines, nor did you choose to give Elizabeth up in the first place, 
you still feel like your ignorant actions played a part. Yet again, another game plays on the notion that the player believes everything they are doing must be the right thing to do. Booker is a bad person. Comstock is a bad person. You are a bad person. Booker, stop it! Sure, all of this extremely convoluted plot could be told to you, like I just did, in the movie or book form. But imagine playing it out, discovering these little pieces to a puzzle as you go, intentionally searching trash can after trash can to see if there's anything important. The act of putting these pieces together while you play creates a feeling of accomplishment I'd argue is unmatched from what film or a piece of literature could provide. You are not an observer, you are in the driver's seat. Although the game offers you no choices when it comes to how it ends, you still feel important. It's clear that this is played out over and over. The game makes it clear that Booker has tried to return for Elizabeth time and time again. The only difference now is you. The emotional connection you create with Elizabeth, much like the one you do with Clementine in The Walking Dead, makes your actions much more meaningful. Most of the game is spent learning about her life, and yours without knowing it. She helps you and you help her. You feel guilt for the actions you as a player have never even made, because they occurred before you gained control. But you feel at fault nonetheless. You are glad when you die. It's the final thing you can do to help her. You owe her that. After all, she gave away her life to wipe away the debt that you owed. Oh, this is wonderful! Well, come dance with me, Mr. Dwayne. I don't dance. Before I wrap this up, I think it's important to note that the graphics of a game do not determine its legitimacy as a storytelling medium. Although I am arguing that these advancements in technology allow for a more immersive storytelling experience, that does not mean that a game that doesn't utilize these elements isn't a good story-based game. Take for example the extremely simple Flash game Dysphoria. It gives the player a glimpse into what life is like for a trans woman. These simple, 8-bit style graphics are effective at telling their story in only a small amount of time. This Tetris-looking piece doesn't fit into this brick wall. Simple when you boil it down to its surface-level appearance, but in the context of the game's story, it is a much more meaningful visual, which serves as an important metaphor. The woman in the game just wants to fit herself into that brick wall, but it makes no difference what she does. She never seems to be the right shape. At the end of the game, she realizes that it doesn't matter to her anyway. She is happy being herself. This arbitrary idea of a shape created by our society doesn't concern her. All of that can be deciphered from a very plain graphic. Nothing fancy, no motion tracking or Unreal Engine here. I'll spare you from any more long-winded examples and hope that you have a better grasp of story-based games now, at the end of this video, than you did at the beginning. Video games may not have started as one of the best mediums for storytelling, but they have certainly evolved into one. The immersion and world building created through even just simple pixels on a screen create a sense of curiosity and desire for exploration that keeps people coming back to the same work over and over. It is not uncommon for individuals to have upwards of 200 plus hours in their favorite game. Even if that time is spent replaying, there are almost always unfamiliar elements to explore or new methods to use to complete the game. For some, this is their relaxing downtime. Much like watching a film or reading a book, it is just another way to escape into a different world. Think of a movie you hate. Wasn't very hard, was it? Now, are all movies like that? No, that's a stupid question. That doesn't mean you hate all films. The only similarity between that hated film and the films you love is the medium they exist on. I could ask the same thing about books, or even pieces of art. You wouldn't write off a whole art form due to some things which are not to your taste. Hate violent, gory slasher fix? Watch Barry Lyndon. That movie bore you to death? Watch Escape from New York. You can keep going. All these mediums have genres. Finding one that suits what you desire is key. Hate violent first-person games such as Call of Duty? Play It Takes Two, a co-op game about overcoming marital strife. Too introspective for you? Run a tiny virtual theme park and roller coaster tycoon. I cater this video mainly around story-based games as they are the most similar to works and other art forms such as film and literature that people like and are familiar with. Video games have the ability to capture what you love about those mediums and give you a whole new perspective and way to experience them. They are here waiting for you, and they have been for a while. Maybe I changed your mind a bit from what you once viewed video games as. I won't get my hopes up, but I can dream. Before you go and make a generalizing comment about how violent video games rot our brains, take a second and consider how broad that medium truly is.